Hey guys, Nurse Mike here and welcome to SimpleNursing.com. Before we get today's lecture started, please remember to access your free quiz and preview our cool nifty new study guides not here on YouTube. Click the link right up here at any time during this video. Today we're wrapping up heart attack or MI, that myocardial infarction. So guys, just think, MI, the heart muscles die. Like all heart muscles, the heart needs oxygen to pump. And during a heart attack, there is a blockage in one or more of these oxygen tubes called the coronary arteries. And so the heart muscle suffocates to death. Over 500 cells die per minute. And if blocked over 45 minutes, these cells can die forever called necrosis. So guys, minutes equals muscle. Now what causes this narrowing? Well, fatty deposits called plaque develops on the walls of the coronary arteries, narrowing the vessels which makes it harder for oxygen to get to the heart muscle. So what causes this? Well, just like hypertension, we use the acronym SODA. S for stress. This can cause momentary narrowing. So anxiety, cold temperatures, even physical exercise like sex. And stimulants like caffeine, even amphetamines like meth and Adderall, also narrows the arteries momentarily. But what really causes the most damage here are irritants found in smoking, which scars the arteries. And long-term obesity, Key term here, guys, a BMI over 25. But also diabetes and hypertension can cause stretching and tearing to the coronary arteries, which severely damages them. Coupled with a bad diet high in cholesterol from animal fats like meats and dairies can cause fatty buildup getting stuck in the cracks. And over time, this growth makes the blood vessels stiff and hard, something we call plaque. This plaque causes hardening and narrowing in the arteries, which is typically called atherosclerosis. So just think arteriosclerosis, hardening of the vessels from the scarring and plaque. Lastly, heart disease is more common in African American males and increased age over 50, and more common in men than women. Maybe women just handle stress better than men. I don't know. Eventually, too much plaque can turn into blockages, and if one of these plaques ruptured, usually from stress, a blood clot can form in minutes. And this blood clot can completely block all the oxygen to the heart muscle. Without oxygen, heart cells die within minutes, releasing proteins called troponin. And guys, this is the number one indicator of an MI, but we're gonna cover that in the diagnostic section. Now, narrowing is classified into three sections, under the big umbrella of ischemic heart disease meaning a disease of lower oxygen to the heart. And it comes in three sizes, small, medium, and large, kinda like a pizza. So for small, it's called coronary artery disease. Then stable angina, the stress-induced angina, or basically chest pain. Now medium is ACS, the acute coronary syndrome, which encompasses unstable angina and MI. Now unstable angina is our unsafe angina, which is unrelieved with rest and totally unpredictable. Far worse because it means we're closer to the larger condition of an MI, and then to death. So typically, more pain experienced means more tissue death is occurring. Now as far as signs and symptoms, any complaint of chest pain, guys, is super serious. Exams use the classic keywords of left substernal pain, but guys, now boards are getting way more advanced. So keywords like sudden or crushing pain, even radiating or shooting, and even, keyword here, heavy pressure usually indicates a priority. So we'll see words for pain like substernal chest pain. Everyone knows that one. But here's a big tip. Jaw pain, left arm pain, even mid back or shoulder pain, and even, big one here, heartburn or epigastric pain. Coupled with SOB or shortness of breath, dyspnea and even labored breathing. Now nausea and vomiting and abdominal pain, not classic signs, but big for MI. Also sweating called diaphoresis, and even pale, cold skin, known as dusky, and even anxiety. Now here's a tricky thing. Diabetic patients can have something called a silent MI with no classic signs or symptoms. Guys, they have dead nerves from diabetic neuropathy, basically meaning they can't feel it. And even women commonly tough it out, thinking they're just tired or something. So typically, MIs in diabetics and women often go unnoticed. Now as far as diagnostics for MI, both labs and imaging, any new chest pain always requires an EKG first. Big NCLEX tip. And no, you don't need to know how to read a 12-lead EKG for the NCLEX, or even the five other rhythms or views of an MI. But you do need to know for the NCLEX ST elevation and ST depression. 
So ST elevation usually means no O2. Or it could mean hyperkalemia, that high potassium. So we always confirm with troponin labs. So think if ST is high, then the heart muscles have died. And if ST is low, we always think low O2. Now this is called ST depression or T wave inversion, again caused by that low O2, aka ischemia. Meaning only partial blockage, or it could be from hypokalemia. And typically ST segments will go back to normal when we get reperfusion. So we confirm it with blood labs. Guys, write this down. Troponin is our number one indicator for MI. It's our gold standard. So again, write it down. Troponin over 0.5 indicates trauma to the heart. As heart muscles die, this protein leaks out into the blood, along with potassium. So patients will also have high potassium, aka hyperkalemia. But our other labs like CK, CKMB, and even CRP, these are important, but guys, they're not commonly tested on the NCLEX. Now, a very common NCLEX question always shows an EKG with ST elevation or gives you a positive troponin over 0.5. Guys, this always indicates an MI. So we treat with drugs like Mona, but we're gonna cover that in a moment. But guys, the goal is always to unclog the oxygen tube within 45 minutes. So patients are taken to the cath lab immediately to locate and fix the blockages. We call it the ABCs of MI surgery. An angioplasty, AKA PCI, is used to both visualize and move aside the blockages with either a balloon or stent. A bypass, also called cabbage, to go around more severe blockages using a piece of vein or artery from another part of the body, usually the leg. Or we can just cut out the blockage called an endardectomy. Now we can also use thrombolytics, aka clot busters, if surgery is not immediately available. Now these are called TPA or streptokinase, but they're usually not routinely given as first line therapy, since they can cause massive bleeding. And usually they have to be given within two to six hours of initial MI. But we're gonna cover these treatments in the treatment section. So now if troponin comes back negative, meaning no MI, we commonly do a different test to diagnose the narrowing here. This is called a stress test, where we stress out the heart, seeing how it responds with low oxygen. It's all done to help pinpoint potential blockages. So two types of stress tests are given, either an exercise or treadmill stress test, and non-exercise, called nuclear pharmacology. So exercise or treadmill stress test, we're looking for ST changes indicative of myocardial ischemia, basically low oxygen in the heart. So remember the three S's. During a stress test, we stop for chest pain or ST changes. Guys, big test tip right there. The NCLEX is gonna ask for which immediate action by the nurse is of first priority. Now the answer is always to stop the test for ST changes or chest pain. Now as far as non-exercise nuclear stress tests, a radioactive dye tracer is injected into the vessels acting kind of like a highlighter to help pinpoint potential blockages. Now a big test tip before chemical stress test, guys, write this down, huge NCLEX tips here. Since we're trying to diagnose narrowing, we teach the patient to avoid the meds and stimulants that can alter the test. Now four big key terms, always on select all that apply questions. We avoid the C's and avoid the T's. So 24 to 48 hours before, we're always gonna avoid cigarettes and caffeine including teas, sodas, and coffee. Guys, not even decaf. Even decaf contains small amounts of trace caffeine. And we're avoiding cardiac meds like nitro and beta blockers. These two can relax the heart too much and are gonna alter the test. And lastly, guys, we're avoiding theophylline, the respiratory drug. This guy acts like a stimulant causing narrowing. So write that down. Theophylline always comes up on exams here. Now, one last tidbit here, guys. There's no eating or drinking four hours before and after the test. We're not talking 12 here, so just NPO four hours before and after. Now for MI treatments, guys, again, think any acute chest pain, we always have to think heart attack. Basically, MI, the heart dies. Regardless if it's only a bad burrito or maybe it's just heartburn. The thing is we don't know until we get an EKG and troponin. So guys, always think the worst. So right now we give drugs to open up those oxygen tubes. Next, we remove the blockage and after we give the heart rest and prevent any future clots. Now you've heard the term Mona, but for the NCLEX, the correct sequence is oxygen for perfusion, 
Aspirin, our antiplatelet congregator, to prevent platelets from sticking together and forming a bigger clot. Nitro opens those coronary oxygen tubes to provide more oxygen to the heart muscle. And morphine helps the heart to relax, decreasing the workload. Now, all these drugs help get and conserve oxygen immediately. So big test tips for nitro, no Viagra, AFIL ending drugs like zildenafil. Remember, AFIL will kill since both are potent vasodilators. It causes vascular collapse from low blood pressure. Now some other highly tested points here. Guys, three doses, a maximum of five minutes apart, no swallowing, always sublingual under the tongue, and headache and orthostatic hypotension are common, so guys, we take this drug while sitting to prevent fall risk. Now, a little side note, for chronic angina patients at home, we teach them to call 911 if there's pain five minutes after the first dose. Big NCLEX key term here, guys. Pain five minutes after the first dose. Now, test tips for morphine, guys. Any chest pain after morphine indicates an MI, even if it's only one or two out of 10. NCLEX key word here is chest pain or unrelieved pain after morphine. Typically, more pain equals more tissue death. Now we fix the clot with cath lab and clot busters. So for cath lab, just think it clears the clot. Also called PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention. Key terms that show up on exams are arterio or even angioplasty. Now angiographies or even angiograms are images taken via x-rays to visualize the blockage. And plasty means balloon or stent placement, requiring more recovery time. Patients are usually awake, not under general anesthesia. So before were NPO six to 12 hours, meaning no eating or drinking. And after, patients will lie flat for several hours and are encouraged to drink to dilute that contrast dye, which we'll be covering next. Now bypass, also called open heart surgery, requires more recovery time, around three to five days in the hospital. So words including bypass like coronary artery bypass graft, or even mid-cab, minimally invasive direct coronary artery bypass graphing. Usually a shorter recovery time because there's a smaller incision in between the ribs. Now post-operative general rules here. We avoid lifting heavy objects and we protect incisions from infection. So big no-nos here guys. No baths or soaking the wound. But a shower is okay if they avoid soaking the wound underwater. We want to prevent infection here. So we monitor for redness, warmth, swelling, and draining, specifically at the incision site. If there's any of these, then we report it to the HCP immediately. Now, test tips for cath lab. Guys, always think contrast kills the kidneys, usually used in procedures previously mentioned. So contrast dye, also called iodine, is a thick dye highlighter used to find blockages and narrowing. But it's really hard for the kidneys to wash it out of the blood. It's kind of like dumping cement into the washing machines of the body. So think thick dye, the kidneys will die. Now here are the top seven test questions that come up with cath lab. Just remember the ABCs. A for allergy to iodine, and yes, warm flushing is normal. So guys, allergies to shellfish is actually not used as a tool anymore to screen for iodine allergies, according to the last NCLEX update. B is for bleeding at the catheter site, direct or manual pressure on or above the site for any potential bleed. And patients will be lying flat hours after, aka supine. So NCLEX key terms here, guys, write these down. We're not putting the patient in semifowlers and no crossing the legs. Also, no blood thinners within a six hour window. This means no heparin, no warfarin, aspirin, or even clopidogrel. Now C is for creatinine, always indicating kidney function. Normally 0.9 to 1.2. So remember, contrast kills the kidneys kind of like dumping that thick cement into a washing machine. So creatinine over 1.3 usually means an injured kidney, also called contrast nephropathy. So we avoid renal failure patients, and key word here guys, write this down, diabetics on metformin. We stop metformin 48 hours before and after the cath lab. We want to prevent lactic acidosis and nephropathy. And we can give mucamus to protect the kidneys but it's not common on the NCLEX. So remember, iodine is like thick dye. The kidneys will die. Always a big NCLEX tip. Now the last C, you can't palpate the pedal pulse after surgery. Guys, we always call the doctor, AKA HCP, healthcare provider. 
Remember this, pulses equals perfusion. Normally we get diminished pulses, but only four to 12 hours max, not one to two days. So NCLEX keywords here, guys. Cold, cool, or remarkably cool legs, absent pulses or non-palpable, or even just present with a Doppler ultrasound. Big no-no, lack of perfusion. Now we can also give clot busters like TPA to dissolve the clot. So let's review the top tested content right here from our DVT video. Now fibrinolytics, AKA clot busters, which are not routine for DVTs, but are still used, these guys are like the atomic bomb. They're one-time push drugs. So we give either TPA or streptokinase. But guys, streptokinase has the most allergies associated with it. And the big thing with these atomic bombs is the huge bleeding risk. Since it has an eight hour or less duration, this means we are most at risk to bleed during that eight hour window. So guys, no injections at all, no new IVs, no sub-Qs even for diabetics, no IMs, and definitely no ABGs. These drugs can only be given through a compressible site like an IV. So we never give these through a central line because we can't hold pressure on that central line. Only peripheral lines here. Okay, now after the MI, we want to prevent clots and give the heart some rest. So heparin is used to stabilize unresolved clots and prevent the growth of current ones. Now, big NCLEX keywords here, guys. Heparin does not dissolve clots. Only clot busters dissolve clots, like TPA. And to give the heart some rest, we use BCD drugs. Beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and dilators like nitro. So here are the big NCLEX test tips for pharmacology. Again, guys, we took over 10,000 NCLEX questions here, and here are the most tested key words. Write these down. Again, heparin prevents clots by thinning the blood, so we have a huge bleed risk. So the therapeutic range for coagulation therapy is to keep the PTT between the ranges, guys, write these down, 46 to 70, always on the NCLEX. Typically, a standard is three times max range. Now, the antidote for heparin is protamine sulfate. So our memory trick is hepit, like a frog. Just think H for heparin is hepit for PTT and protamine sulfate. Now for all the NCLEX keywords and memory tricks for beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and dilators like nitro, we include all that stuff in our pharmacology section. So we'll leave a link right here for the membership site. Now for complications after an MI, like a car crash, the heart has some pretty serious damage, specifically to the left ventricle, which happens to be the main pump, giving oxygen and blood pressure to the entire body. So when this guy fails, we end up with some deadly complications. So our three most deadliest complications here. Number one being cardiogenic shock. We're talking BP so low, it's on the flow. So we watch for signs and symptoms of low cardiac output, being low blood pressure, agitation or confusion, cool and clammy, pale white skin with low urine output, less than 30 mLs per hour. Guys, we need to increase that blood pressure fast with epi, dopamine, and norepi. Now, VFib and VTAC occurs in around 90% of recovering MI patients. Yes, that's correct, guys, 90%. Since the damaged heart sort of glitches or short circuits like a broken computer, slipping into deadly rhythms like VFib and VTAC. So remember, we always defibrillate if we don't have a pulse, and always early defibrillation before CPR if given a choice. Big NCLEX tip. We choose DFib for VFib. And we also use cardioversion if you can count a pulse. And always remember to synchronize. Lastly, heart failure is a big issue, or pump failure we call it. Since we have a damaged pump, it fails to pump blood forward, and now it backs up into the lungs and or body, eventually drowning the patient. So remember, HF in heart failure is HF for heavy fluid. Guys, always report these key words. Rapid weight gain. Usually it means water gain. Worsening crackles can mean lung fluid and even sudden edema or JVD. And even big keyword here, new S3 heart sounds or murmurs. NCLEX keywords like rapid, worsening, and sudden usually indicates a priority patient. Always the number one intervention is pushing IV diuretics, like furosemide. Guys, they end in ide, so think the body is dried. And a little side note, not isorcerbide, that's a nitrate for chest pain. Lastly, two other conditions are common, pericarditis and mitral valve prolapse. In pericarditis, the inflammation to the sac around the heart 
can lead to deadly pericardial effusions or cardiac tamponade. This is where the heart is basically squished to death by its own blood sac, causing the heart to stop beating. Very common on the NCLEX since it's very deadly. So guys, we always monitor for Beck's triad. So remember Beck, B for big jugular veins or jugular vein distension, E for extremely low BP, and C for you can't hear the heart sounds, also called muffled or distant heart sounds. Now with mitral valve prolapse, the little cords holding the valves can suddenly snap loose from a dead heart muscle. Now the patients will have a heart murmur and even develop atrial fibrillation from blood backing up, stretching out those atria. Now after an MI, we teach the two Ds, diet and lifestyle change and drugs, or AKA pharmacology. Now it's not that we're just teaching them about diet and exercise. We're nursing a broken heart here. Now our goal here is to prevent heart failure. So the heart needs a few weeks off with less pressure and less workload. Now we do this with low sodium and low fluid intake. So we educate the patient about the acronym DRESS. So say yes to the DRESS. Now D is for diet low in sodium and fluids. So remember the two and two. Two grams and two liters per day or less. This will reduce blood pressure and prevent heart failure. So we watch for heavy fluid. So we educate patients to take their own pulse. Guys, write that one down, big key word there. We also do daily weights, never weekly, but daily. And guys, any rapid weight gain or any new edema or worsening dyspnea, also called orthopenia, we call the doctor. These are early signs of heart failure. And finally, we teach the avoidance of high sodium foods like chips, dressings, ketchup, meats, cheeses, basically anything that comes in a package. Always remember here, sodium swells the body. And with heart failure, we're preventing heavy fluid. Now R is for reducing stress, alcohol, caffeine, and here's a big one, low cholesterol from animal fats. So avoid animal products like beef, poultry, and dairy products like cheese and creams. We're avoiding any and all land animals, but fish, that's okay. Now a side note again, the numbers you need to know for the NCLEX. All land animals increase bad cholesterol like total cholesterol, triglycerides, and LDLs, the loser lipids. High cholesterol means high clogging, and these numbers love to show up on the NCLEX and exam, so guys, write these down. All these numbers should be low except HDLs, the happy lipids, the only ones that should be high, over 40. So HDLs help get rid of the bad cholesterol. And also, eating fiber found in fruits and veggies can help clean out that cholesterol. So listen to your mama, and eat those veggies. E is for exercise, 30 minutes, five days a week. This not only increases HDLs, those happy lipids, but also strengthens the weak heart. S is for smoking sensation, big NCLEX key term there, guys. It prevents scarring, AKA atherosclerosis. And another key term here, guys, is S for sex. That's correct, sex. It can only be resumed only after climbing two flights of stairs with no shortness of breath. Big key word right there. Now a little test tip about therapeutic communication after an MI. Most patients don't even see a need to change, but it's your responsibility as the healthcare provider to assess their fears, guys, by asking questions and teaching. So big keywords for the test. Avoid keywords like accusing, blaming, and even asking why, and speaking of things to avoid. So we teach patients to avoid NSAIDs like keywords here, guys, ibuprofen and naproxen those non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These guys can cause an increased risk for thrombotic effects, aka a risk for clots. And this causes future MIs. Now speaking of drugs, we can always use the ACEs and ARBs to decrease the blood pressure. Now a lot of NCLEX questions come from pharmacology, and we do a full video for both ACEs and ARBs and all the other cardiac drugs in the pharmacology section. Okay, lastly, we can give two very particular drugs that prevent future MIs. Let's play that segment right here. So think AC for anti-clogging of the arteries. A is for antiplatelets like aspirin and clopidogrel, brand name Plavix. This guy prevents platelets from clumping together and forming clots. And C for cholesterol-lowering drugs. Guys, these end in statin like lovastatin. So remember, stay clean because it cleans out the arteries, keeping them free from cholesterol. Now, since statins prevent the production of cholesterol in the liver, it is very liver toxic. So guys, don't give this to patients with liver problems like hepatitis or cirrhosis. Oh, and also avoid grapefruit juice since it blocks statin drugs. All right, guys, that wraps it up for MI. Don't forget to take your quiz in the practice area. Thanks for watching. 
For our full video and new quiz bank, click right up here to access your free trial. And please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. Last but not least, a big thanks to our team of experts helping us make these great videos. All right, guys, see you next time.